The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. And hello everyone and welcome to the Social Justice Forums. I'm Darren Jaime. If you're asking the question, what is this show about? Well, we talk about the inequities that many people face. We also have an opportunity to promote civic conversation and dialogue. Civic engagement is important. We want you to stay connected because the Social Justice Forum starts right now. And welcome back to the show. New Settlement envisions a vibrant, diverse, and equitable community in which all individuals and families have the power to make quality choices about education, employment, housing, wellness, and creative expression. Now, the organization collaborates with community residents and develops partnerships, creating services and opportunity that celebrate the inherent dignity and potential of individuals as well as families. New Settlement has made a noticeable difference in the quality of life in the neighborhood and is poised to do so in the future. Joining us now and sharing a little bit more about the work of their organization is the executive director of New Settlement. We're pleased to be joined by Rigo Noel. And uh, Rigo, good to have you. Good to, good to be here, Darren. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Um, you know, part of quality of life is having a quality neighborhood. I know the work that you do really specifies in trying to build up community and building it through a healthy neighborhood. So for somebody who may not know about New Settlement, please introduce yourself. Sure, my name is Rigo I'm the executive director of New Settlement. Um, and it's interesting because we were actually founded um, uh, close to 30 years ago. Our parent company actually bought 14 abandoned buildings here in the Mount Eden section of the Bronx. Um, and they renovated it and it was mainly for low income um, families uh, and those that were homeless. And from that, uh, New Settlement was born because after the buildings were renovated, uh, they wanted to provide programs for those residents. And New Settlement offered a variety of programs. And, and to this day, we service about 17,000 families in the Mount Eden section of the Bronx, uh, providing a, a variety of services from after school programs, college uh, readiness programs. Uh, we have a food action or community organizing. Uh, and it really is important that we continue to invest in this community. Uh, as, you, as, as you know, the pandemic has really had a tremendous impact. And the fact that New Settlement stands ready to continue providing services, virtual and in person, really shows how much we are committed to this community. Yeah, when we talk about the COVID, obviously, a couple of things really come to mind. Number one is unemployment. A lot of people actually lost their jobs during this COVID-19 pandemic and trying to really find their way back. And I know that some of the work that you do works in uh, workforce development and really preparing people to try to enter into the workforce. And as we know, COVID has caused some changes to happen. How have you been able to uh, connect with people and also position them uh, for this challenge? Well, well, I think the YAY program, the Young Adult Opportunity Initiative, is really the, the perfect program that addresses that need. Uh, we really engage with students that um, may have been disconnected uh, from their families, the, from the community, really didn't have a sense of direction. And so we take them and provide them a three-month intensive program where there's really four main components, right? So students first, uh, they'll receive job readiness training, cover letter, resume writing, Second, they'll get one-on-one -on -one support with a youth advisor, um, having that person be there as sort of a, a mentor as they sort of go through this uh, intensive program and the process. Uh, third, we provide every student with National Safety Council CPR and first aid certification. And fourth, we provide uh, them access to mutual aid peer groups. We wanna make sure that they're talking to each other uh, as they're going through this life-changing process. Uh, and it was so funny when we had the press conference with Assemblywoman Joyner, after the press conference, there was a student there, uh, we sat in a circle and he actually used his first aid uh, certification and experience to save someone. Uh, and it's just, it, just the minor, the major things that, the things that we take for granted uh, as a CPR certification, it, 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 he, he said that that's something that he never thought he would have used. And the YOI program provided him that experience. And so you have other students that were going into fashion, other students 
uh, in college because of the experience that they had with YOI. And this is the critical piece, like who will look out for our black and brown children if were it not for this program, right? Who will help them? And I think that that's why I, we were so excited that Assemblywoman Joyner invested $150,000 to, to really help us service more students because even though it may be a drop in the bucket, it allows us to service 300 students. And you talk about servicing students, that's preparing them for the future. And that's really what needs to be done. And you gave an excellent example of what happened like firsthand when you had a student actually administer uh, CPR. Give me a little bit more on the background side, because when we talk about the background of, of, of your students, some of them come with some skill sets, some come with no skill sets, but by the time they leave, you definitely have them in a far greater position. And, and, and that, that's, thank you for mentioning that, Darren, because I think it's important to, to know that we are not the program that's selective, right? We, we don't want kids to be super prepared and, and, and that way um, they don't require much assistance in getting a job. We accept everyone that walks through our doors. And I think that's what separates us from some of the other nonprofits. It, it doesn't matter where they're coming from, what they're going through, we are going to help them get to where they want to be. Uh, and so we have some students where they may not have enough food to eat at night. They may have some uh, housing security issues. Uh, we have some, some students suffering from mental health issues. Um, and so yesterday we had a student that said they weren't ready to enter the workforce yet mentally and they wanted some time, right? And so these are the types of, of students that we're dealing with and what we are there to do is really provide them with the hope and the, the belief that they can do it with our help, right? And we wanna empower them. We wanna give them a sense of agency as they sort of go through this, this process. And as you talk about the process, give us that, you know, um, how long is the program and uh, how long do they have to participate? And so the program is unique in that after the three months of training where they go through uh, the job readiness component, they have the, the peer mentors, uh, they have the youth advisor and they have that CPR training, is that after those three months, uh, the, the grant will provide 90 of those students will have job placement and internships guaranteed, right? Which is significant. Um, and then also after they leave the program in those three months, they don't forget about us because we follow up on them, with them, right? So it's not about after the three months, you're on your own. No, they become part of that family. Uh, and it's so interesting some of the staff at the Young Adult Opportunity Initiative are actually alumni of the program. And so it, it comes full circle where you have students that went through the program, continue to be connected and we employ them so that way they can carry that message forward for the next generation. And as you look at the young people today, you hear this saying, oh, they don't wanna work. The truth of the matter is they do wanna work. And uh, sometimes there are these barriers in those, in those challenges. You can tell better than I can. For somebody who wants some more information about what are some of the challenges when you're talking about these young people trying to enter into the workforce that maybe we're not paying attention to? I, I think one of the biggest challenges that were, it was so interesting when you, when you get to, to hear their stories, one of the challenges is really that support system. And I can't stress that enough, right? Uh, I think Assemblywoman Joyner uh, mentioned it you need a support system, you need a mentor, you need someone to go to, you need, you need access to that support system. And a lot of our young people don't have that access, right? They don't have that person that's pushing them to do better, that person that's saying, hey, hey how can I help you? And so we wanna make sure that our doors are always open, right? Our staff are always available for our young people. If you have a question, we are there to answer it. If you need a shoulder to cry on, we are there to be there with you. If you are hungry, we are there to feed you. All of the, the, the barriers that, that prevent young people from succeeding, it's really, it can't be understated that they need someone to be their champion. They need that level of support. Uh, and so some of the young people that, that we encounter, the barriers can range from mental health issues, housing insecurity, hunger, all of these issues that we need to address those issues before they're even contemplating their next move in life. And so we wanna make sure that we provide those resources for our young people so that way they can focus on their career, they can focus on their education. 
COVID-19 has definitely had a huge impact on a lot of people. How did it affect the organization in terms of your connectivity with, the, with, with your clients? So that, that was interesting uh, because it, it, it forced us to, to rethink how we provide services. We really wanted to continue. And then we thought, I think we're able to do this, right? We're able to continue to service our families. Uh, we actually pivoted uh, a lot of our programming to virtual. We provided one-on-one -on -one guidance counseling. We did wellness checks on all of our students. And during COVID, we actually still had the YAY program. It was still operating we still had a class for the three months uh, in COVID. And honestly, we kept moving, right? The community, uh, as devastated as it was, continued to, need, can, continued to need the resources that we were providing, right? And that's not gonna stop us from, uh, from serving those that are desperately in need. And so we were able to continue our services remotely. Uh, we actually were able to, to provide food support. Uh, we had pop-ups, we were able to give out over 850 food bags in collaboration with Columbia University and Global Humanitaria. Uh, and we were able to do uh, provide stipends for students uh, that were uh, facing uh, emergency need. Uh, so we were able to really provide as much as we can as an organization to the community. And I really just wanna acknowledge the hard work of our staff because during this time, let alone dealing with their own issues surrounding COVID-19, they really stepped up and really continued to be there and were committed to providing quality services for our families and our community. So really, really proud of the great staff that we have here at New Settlement. Yeah. How did you deal with the issue of food insecurity? Because uh, were you finding that a lot of your families and your clients and were, were in that need? Because one thing that became very prevalent during this time was the fact that there was a lack of jobs and for many New Yorkers, a lack of food. Yeah, that, that's a great point, Darren. Um, we actually, <laughs> we, we partnered with two organizations, Global Humanitarian, Columbia University, and then we decided that, you know what, I think we can do our own food pop-ups, right? So we actually held food pop-ups every two weeks uh, for um, the last, uh, I want to say, six weeks of program here in our community center, uh, where we provided over 1,200 food bags uh, for families that were in need. Um, and then right, actually, we also partnered with United Neighborhood Houses, where we actually provided gift cards to families uh, as part of our Juneteenth celebration uh, for $150. Uh, and we provided that to over 150 families. So we, we, we met the need. We continue to, to seek partnerships that will help us address the food insecurities that are facing our community. Uh, we are uh, working with United Way and potentially uh, opening a, a food pantry here at the community center. Uh, and so we are, we are looking for ways to continue to address that need. Yeah. As we look towards the summer, I mean, we're right here in the thick of it right now. And uh, we're glad the weather's warm. We're glad the people are coming outdoors. And, you know, we're not out of the woods of COVID yet, but we're, we're making it. What's been going on at New Settlement during the summertime? We actually have had our biggest summer to date. Uh, we are partnering with the Department of Education on Summer Rising. Uh, we are actually servicing over 600 uh, young people and students uh, in our programs. Uh, we have our first ever our community center, a state-of-the-art facility here on Jerome Avenue. We're actually having our first uh, summer camp there as well. And so the summer uh, is so interesting. The kids are so excited to be here. Uh, they, they've been indoors. They, they've had the remote learning and they're excited. Uh, we have uh, a swim camp here. And so students in all of our, our programs are, are, are attending our swim camp. They are learning how to swim. And it's important for, for children of color to learn how to swim. As you know, the statistics are dire uh, about students, uh, about children of color drowning and, and the, their capacity to learn how to swim. So we, we are super excited. The summer is, is what we are used to prior, prior to COVID uh, ravaging this community. So we, we are super excited about summer. Excited to see the kids' faces, I'm sure. Obviously, when we've had a, nothing but virtual for a long period of time, what's it been like for them having the ability to actually connect on a personal level? It's so interesting. They, they connect right away. They make friends the first day. They, then they're inseparable. Uh, and so <laughs> you see the smile of their faces. They're like, oh, you're my best friend now, right? And so that, that type of human interaction was so, it, it was taken away from them during COVID. And so now they have that opportunity to connect on a deeper level, not on a screen, and they are taking full advantage of it. And so we also have our college access programs operating. We have our or community organizing programs operating and also our workforce development programs are also in operation. So 
all of our programs are fully functional during the summer. Uh, we really don't take a break. Uh, the community needs us. And so we're here to service them in anywhere that we can. Yeah. And so when people want to find out about the services that you provide and the things that you do, uh, give people an opportunity to know how they can connect with you. Sure. Uh, they can go to newsettlement.org uh, and really uh, take a look at all of our programs and our contact information is there. Uh, and if there's anything, there's a way that they can actually send us a communication on our website. So feel free to visit and we look forward to welcoming you in any one of our programs in the near future. Yeah. And before we go, tell us a little bit about your staff. Obviously, you got some great staff working there. What has it been like, given the fact that the last 15 months we've been the way that we have? Uh, how's it been for the staff? The staff has really been really the, the backbone of this organization. Uh, they have put our families and our students first above their own needs. They show up to work every day. Um, and, and their commitment and dedication to the Mount Eden section of the Bronx and the Bronx overall has been second to none. Uh, and so we have staff members that are alumni of the program and they know firsthand how, how much this program means to this community. We have staff from the neighborhood. They see their kids in the street saying, hey, why are you not in after school program? Let's go. And so they continue to be engaged and they are committed. And so I am happy to lead a workforce of dedicated professionals uh, that we have here at New Settlement. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, uh, thank you for coming and being with us and sharing a little bit about the organization. Great work that's going on over there at New Settlement. Rigo, we're glad to have you. Thank you, Darren. I appreciate the opportunity. And thank you for continuing to tell the much needed stories here in the Bronx. Got to tell them. There's a lot of positive stories and we rely on people such as yourself to be able to bring them to us because uh, there's some great people doing some great things. We just have to be that bridge. I'm glad I can be that bridge. I'm glad you're on the other side of that bridge. Thank you. All righty. Rigo's our guest here on the Social Justice Forums. We encourage you to stay with us. We got more show. We'll be back in a few. but there's also a lot of food insecurity. We're giving out healthy food options, and that's what's key here. If you're a senior, you have a disability, they'll actually deliver meals to you. The residents are anxious, they're worried, they're scared, and they want to be tested. When things were happening in our community, and, and we couldn't get the help. There's almost a presumption of criminality that, that attaches to your skin color. The site will prioritize those who are at highest risk in the population. If you feel symptoms and you'd like to visit one of these COVID-19 testing sites here in the Bronx, you may call the state health department's hotline. Important to note about this site is no reservations are needed. This is a walk-in clinic. A lot of us are out of work and looking for something to do. We have the machinery and the skills to make large scale of these masks and gowns. Take care of your people. Well, it's going to go way further than we actually can understand. Right now, employees like myself are just adjusting to the new reality.
you're struggling to afford your internet bills during the pandemic, there's a temporary government program that may be able to help. It's called the Emergency Broadband Benefit, and it provides up to $50 monthly discount on your broadband bill to qualifying households. Find more information about the program, including if you qualify and how to enroll at FCC.gov slash broadband benefit, or call toll free at 833-511-0311. That's show our next guest is a restorative justice advocate who focuses on building community and empowering student voices he encourages social emotional growth for students experiencing trauma instead of the traditional school disciplinary methods he believes education and restorative justice practices are tools where students can examine social justice issues and then become active students impacting their communities please be joined by the restorative justice coordinator Jorge Santos and uh, Jorge, good to have you. Thank you, Darren. Thank you for having me. Great. And uh, when we talk about working with youth, um, obviously, we know that there are some disciplinary measures that are handed down in terms of dealing with youth. But you've got some pretty good alternatives under your belt. So uh, a little with our audience about the work that you do. Yeah. So a little bit about the work is uh, when we think about a restorative justice model, it's it's really reflective on where do we want to see change, right? We can see the inequities in our schools and in our, in our school culture. Uh, we know that we're operating in what we would call a white supremacy culture, right? And that hit the historical, the way education has been passed down, we have a descendant of the, the racist ways that school was, you know, we forced us to assimilate, right? So now we're trying to build a, a school culture that embraces our, our identities. Right? We want students to feel empowered. We want their voices to be heard. So what happens is that through restorative justice methods, we are really taking on the ideas and philosophies of how are we all interconnected, right? How does my relationship with one another impact me and how does it impact others? So it, it really stems back to not just an alternative to suspensions and, and lowering suspension rates, but it becomes a way of being, right? A, a, a lifestyle. When we think about um, the Egyptian ancient uh, you know, one of their philosophies was know thyself, right? right. So, and, and that's critical for us to allow our students to think about like knowing themselves, right? And not trying to remove their identity from them, but embrace it. So who are you as a whole holistic human being? How, how do you want to present yourself, right? And empowering them for their voices to be heard. And as educators, we really have an opportunity. And I think now more than ever to really shift, right? And, and really create a, a school community that is focused on our child's well-being. And then through sort of justice, through conversations, through being able to hear them out, we do have like a, a space where our students feel like, you know what, I am valuable. I am a human being. I do have a voice and I can create change. And we're seeing that more and more as youth get involved in their communities to really have their voices heard. Yeah, youth are raising their voices more now than ever before, but uh, for a long time, it was somewhat difficult to actually get youth to really articulate and really to be transparent. Now, we do know that they have no problem once they're transparent or just throwing it out there and letting it out there. But for you, having these conversations and inviting them to these conversations, having that participation, share with us how hard, how difficult is it to really get the youth to really look at it from another perspective. Oh yeah, it, it's super difficult. So what we have to do is really sit down and think about how do we build community in the first place? How do we go about creating a space where every student feels like they belong to that community, right? Uh, most of the time, if a student feels like they don't wanna be in school or you know their school's a traumatic place, they're not gonna open up, right? There's gonna be barriers where no student's gonna wanna tell you about what's going on at home or where they're gonna wanna share personal stories with you. And it really starts with us as the educators and the staff members at a school because if we can create a place where we're also vulnerable, where we're sharing our stories, then they, they eventually will open up and share their stories. But it has to be genuine on our part that we actually want to be able to open up about ourselves, but also hear their side as well. And I think that once you form that, those relationships, right, 
when you form that, that's where students start to come together and being like, you know what, I do want to voice this, or I have this issue. And they see you as someone they can come to with a lot of the issues that they're going through. Because sometimes as adults, we sometimes forget they are going through things. And, they, and, and we do want to be able to hear them out. No one's going to open up with you if you have a wall up, right? If I'm an educator and, and I don't talk about who I am outside of that school, how do, what is my identity, then they're not going to open up about who they are, right? And you kind of create that wall. Now, if you break down that wall and you're kind of like, yeah, you know, I like playing basketball and, and you know, I used to play ball here. And, you know, actually, you know, I used to like hang around this neighborhood. Then they start to see you as a human being, right? And it's important that as they see us as human beings, we as educators, the adults in that room also see them as human beings, right? As an equal. Uh, one of the issues that I have with the structures of school is, you know, teachers standing up in front of the classroom, students sitting down and looking up at the teacher as if, you know, the teacher is some sort of figure that's better than them, right? And we want to kind of like deconstruct that. We want to break that down. We want students to feel equal, right? right. Maybe I say something that they don't agree with and they want to challenge that. Classrooms should be a space where they can challenge ideas. Right? That's how they develop their, their point of views and how they can begin to articulate themselves. And I think that the more teachers start to investigate, how do I dismantle certain structures in a classroom that are creating inequities, then we're going to create a positive space of learning and also a space where we can understand why students are struggling because we know what's going on at home and we know what's going on in their lives and we, we're going to develop, we're, we're going to be able to understand their needs. What about the conversations on racial equity? Obviously, in COVID, we became introduced to Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and most of, uh, most of all, George Floyd. We watched that trial play out. Everybody in America and across the world really had some sentiment about the George Floyd death and then subsequently the Derek Chauvin trial. But that is nothing more than a microcosm of a macrocosm of the things that we're actually dealing with out here in America. And this conversation about racial equity, uh, as young people, they're introduced to the race, the race card and the race game at a pretty early age, particularly in the inner city. What's it like with those conversations and what kind of conversations are you having around racial equity? Yeah, there is a lot of work to be done, right? Um, anyone of color, especially the black community understands that what we witnessed during that time is something that has been going on for many, many years. So, you know, there's people now that are like, oh, I want to get involved. And that's great. But they also need to understand that this is a space that we are living through and walking in at a con at constantly, right? We understood the police brutality, the way that it impacts our communities, the way that um, a, a black man is in prison at, at a rate of one to three, right, compared to a white counterpart. Uh, Latinos that are one to six and white males one to 18, right? There's a big disparity there. So what, we, what we're doing, some of the work that we're doing is sitting down and analyzing where are the, looking at data and realizing that there are huge disparities. From an uh, administration and teacher point of view, sitting down and looking at, well, we're noticing that if we are suspending students at a higher rate that are Latino and, and black and brown, well, why is that? Is it, is it that there's something wrong with the, the structures that we're setting up? And then how do we dismantle that? Give you a small example would be like homework, right? And grading homework. So if we were to give grades out for homework and you know that when a student goes home that they may have to care for a parent, a sibling, that they may have to work a job to support their parent to make ends meet. Well, then that's not fair that that kid is also being graded with another student that may have a tutor at home, right? Or has parents that can support them that understand the language. So it's really putting on a lens of, well, where do we see inequities that are caused by race? And how do we go about creating equitable structures, right? Eliminating structures that we know are gonna impact our students. That is one of the first steps that we can take from an administration and teacher role is being able to investigate how oppression is showing up in that classroom. And there's a lot of work that has to be done around privilege, right? How does privilege show up for anyone? Where does oppression show up? And how do we go about understanding a student's intersectional identity, right? Um, so we wanna make sure that we're doing that work in the administration role. As students, is being able to open up this space and being very clear and open about the, the racist history of our country, right? Us being able to be like, hey, this is, this is what's happened. How do we go about making it better though, right? Because there has to be, we have to come from a place of hope. And I think that that's one of the most important thing that we, our communities, especially people of color, have always come from a place of hope and from a place of pushing our communities forward. When you think about the civil rights movement, and I think that right now we are living through a modern day civil rights movement, we're always constantly making our communities better. 
And I think that our students have to be empowered knowing that, that even though we're, we may be going through dark days, that our people are, have always been freedom fighters, have always pushed for liberation. And that's the movement that we're seeing now. We want them to get involved. And they're gonna need the information to understand how race does play a role in their communities and also in their lives as well. And I think that the more information they receive, the more they're able to understand how looking at our history can also improve our future, that's critical. That's critical work and we want them to be able to do that. We know that when it comes to history, it's history or his story. There's another story that's actually being told out there, another narrative. And for children and youth to be able to have a voice and to be able to be a part of that narrative is very, is very powerful, especially now. We're seeing now more than ever, more young people actually rise up, become active in activism, uh, really raising their voices, shouting out against injustice, the racial inequities that people are facing. Take me inside uh, your organization. Talk to me about some of these conversations. What are you actually hearing on the part of young people that maybe we can articulate to a wider audience? Yeah, well, we want our, our, our communities, our schools to be centers of healing, right? That's the most important part. We're all bringing in trauma into these places, right? Our students bring trauma into our school. So it's really about sitting down and figuring out how do we heal? How do we heal the harms of, you know, such, such a history that has impacted, you know, our, our generations for years? So it's, you know, students are really open and receptive to critiquing the way things are, which is always positive. And I think that's something that the youth has always had over adults, being able to critique. And I think it also stems back to their curiosity, right, of what could be. Um, I, I, and we don't want to limit that curiosity and that creativity. So allowing our students to sit down really play around with, well, what would your ideal world be? What would your ideal community be? How do you create that community here in this classroom? And allowing them to do that, formulate, formulating interconnectedness with other individuals in that classroom, relationships, being able to solve conflict within that, using those skills in a classroom level, as they become adults, they're gonna use those same skills. And that's where the restorative justice, you know, conflict, de-escalating conflict skills come into play, building relationships come into play because you want them to ideally move on and go into their communities and bring about this positive change. So if they're getting those skills at a young age where they're able to critique, analyze, reflect and grow, that's exactly what we want our students to be doing. And that's what we're seeing right now. That's why students are like, they're so passionate about making sure their, their voices are heard, especially when issues impact them, right? Because we all know when we were kids, we hated when our parents told us something we're like, no, you know, like I don't, right? But we also were also told, hey, you can't talk about that, which I think we kind of have to start shifting that, right? We have to listen as to why our students feel a certain way when they're told something and kind of reflect like, okay, is this something that may be causing some kind of trauma or oppression toward our student? Oh, you know what? It is, let me hear them out. Why are they complaining? Why are they angry, right? because they have every right to feel a certain way when it comes to bringing about change, especially you know, when they think about themselves and where they wanna be. We need to be their advocates. We need to support them and we need to give them the proper tools to be able to create impact. Many times we see a child act out, we don't go to the deeper. We scratch the surface and just talk about their action. But from your take and your experience, share with us, you touched upon it just a few seconds ago, I know it's huge, the trauma. You know, when you live in communities, uh, urban communities, you're dealing with poverty, you're dealing with health challenges, you're dealing with a lot of these inequities. And consequently, there's a lot of racial trauma and societal trauma that young people are having to absorb that probably have not had to absorb in generations. Yeah, we're talking about intergenerational social and economic trauma, right, that educators are going to be dealing with for our students. So what we get at, at the face level, right, when we see a student acting out, well, does that, did that student eat breakfast, right? right. Did that student have a rough day at home? Did, did the parent by any chance maybe miss their rent, right? We, this is something that we're navigating and dealing with constantly in our school systems. So when a student acts up, it's not about just being like, you know what, I want to remove them from the classroom, or I want to remove them from the school community. It's can we get people to sit down with them, talk to them about what's going on, and then also be able to hear their story out, right? I think that's one of the most powerful tools that we as educators can give students, to be able to hear their story. And it's not like they're going to open up right away, right? Because we know that there are going to be barriers and walls. They're not going to feel 
trust, they, they, they're not gonna trust a system that they feel has oppressed them for many years. So it's little by little being able to sit down, have conversations, being able to just be like, hey, let's, let's take a walk. Um, I had a student that uh, wanted to play football. He kept telling me about it. And, and I was like, you know what? This kid would be great for that. I called the program up and I was like, can, can this kid get at it? Like he'd be perfect for that. Like he needs that, that sense of family, right? It's being able to hear our students and hear some of their needs and then be, going above and beyond. I, I think, you know, as a teacher, it doesn't start or stop in that classroom. Right, it goes beyond that. Uh, I still have students that have graduated that contact me and hit me up, tell me about how their life is and asking for advice, and I'm more than glad to, to give that to them. I do think that we are are, are, are people that nurture our, our students and, and help them grow. Uh, and I think that when we sit down with students that are having the most trouble, those are the ones that actually need the most attention and love and support, right? Because we want to get through to see what is what is causing that trauma, right? Where can we support them? Where when can the healing begin? And little by little, and it takes, and one thing I will say about restorative justice is it's not a quick fix, right? It's not a, an alternative to suspensions and being like, boom, don't worry about it. You're, you're good. We're, we'll just remove them from the classroom. That's it. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes many, many conversations. And I think that's why people sometimes like, ah, you know, I don't want to invest in it. It takes too much. But this is what our students need. And if we really are true about our craft and the work that we're doing, we're going to invest the time and energy to make sure that we're putting our children in a better position as they leave us and move on to their other schools or to their other careers. Yeah. Before we go, uh, if a parent is out there watching or you got a young person out there watching, how can they get connected to you and uh, what can they do? Yeah, um, my website is jorgesantos.site, S-I-T-E. Feel free to reach out to me. And then uh, I'm big on Instagram, uh, at Restoring Racial Justice. So you can uh, find me there as well too. That's at Restoring Racial Justice. Um, and, and I'm always posting content that hopefully gives people information and inspiration. I think that we, we have to be able to inspire the next generation and also gain inspiration from the youth as well. Yeah. Well, Jorge, I want to thank you so much for being with us here on the show. Certainly a great conversation. Got to bring you back uh, so that we can continue to talk about these topics. They don't go away and we need your voice. Thanks so much, brother. Thank you, Darren. I appreciate you having me. All right, Jorge Santos, our guest here talking about restorative justice. Got more show don't go anywhere. We'll continue with more on the social justice forums in a few. When taking public transportation, don't touch your phone. Carry hand sanitizer and use it immediately upon leaving the bus or train. Avoid touching your face. If someone is coughing or sneezing, move away. Wash your hands with soap and water as soon as possible. Limit contact with poles. If possible, avoid rush hour. Don't eat or drink on public transportation. Keep your bag off the floor or other surfaces. Avoid directly touching turnstiles. Stay up to date with the latest from your local health department and CDC.
back to the show. The Wendy Hilliard Gymnastics Foundation aims to empower the lives of young people from underserved communities, improving their physical and emotional health through the sport of gymnastics. The organization has organized free and low cost gymnastics to underserved communities, serving nearly 25,000 urban youth to date, helping to improve their physical and mental health, and then also providing various programming focused on health and nutrition, sports safety, to career path internships, public speaking, and also New York City Public School admittance. Joining me now to share a little bit about their organization, I am joined by the founder and CEO of the Wendy Hilliard Gymnastics Foundation, Ms. Wendy Hilliard herself. And uh, Wendy, glad to have you here with us. Thank you, glad to be here. So this comes at a good time. I mean, as we're talking about Tokyo, the Olympics, gymnastics will definitely be a point of focus. And uh, for yourself, uh, the opportunity to really uh, give back uh, and give back in such a way that we can see more in communities of color actually take advantage of the sport of gymnastics and then so. Definitely. I mean, I think uh, when you see the Olympics, of course, it's the highest level and it's, it's exciting. I mean, there's no doubt that it's going to be incredible gymnastics um, and, you know, a lot of things going around the top in the world. So I think what it's going to do is inspire a lot of people because gymnastics is a great foundational sport, whether you're going to take it all the way to the Olympics, it just teaches you such great things about controlling your body, flexibility, focus. It's, it's just so good for, for girls and boys is something that most kids should take. Yeah. And so for you, uh, talk about yourself for a minute. You got involved at an early age. You know, a relatively early age. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I actually, I was a swimmer before I started gymnastics. And I didn't really start gymnastics until I was 12, which is technically, you know, it's kind of funny you sound, it sounds late in gymnastics, but um, I stayed in gymnastics for a long time. And the key about gymnastics, people need to understand there's just a, a, a large array of different disciplines. There's the bars and beams, the artistic, which is the big focus in gymnastics, but I was rhythmic. So I, I started relatively young, but here's the thing is that I really loved what I wanted to do. And I knew right from when I started, I wanted to be a high level gymnast. Yeah. And you became a high level gymnast. You went on and uh, went to the world championships, uh, had great experience there and you didn't stop there. I mean, you, you're now you're giving back and you're giving back to young people. And what do you feel as though young people will be able to take away from having a person like you in an organization such as yours? I think what's really wonderful is that when they come to our organization, they see first a, a really staff that's diverse, like the community that we serve. And I think there's definitely a place for that. For one, it's affordable. And that's the key. I love gymnastics. I love my sport gymnastics, but it's kind of an expensive sport, no doubt. So yeah. we've partnered up with our partners so that we can provide the sport in the community. And I think when people come to us, it's one thing to see, which you don't often see in gymnastics, is a gym full of really highly qualified instructors that are from, you know, black and brown. Uh, we're right on the edge of Washington Heights. So we got a big old mix going on in our gym and the Bronx is right there. So it's nice. It makes it feel like community, but it's good gymnastics and everybody is there. I mean, I take it seriously. I really want to teach good gymnastics. It's not a playground. It's, I love gymnastics. It's fun, but there's a way to do it. That's right. And that's what you get in our foundation. Yeah. And you've had some great success stories come through your program. Um, and give us a little bit about the young people and, and what you found that just interacting with gymnastics has done for them, not just for the sp in, in terms of sports, but really in terms of character development. What I found out is that, and I learned this, that I can really trust my athletes, right? So the kids, it's really funny. I, we can't wait till we get everybody back in the gym, but we always do performances at the end of the session, right? And so I, it always surprises me that the kids always up their level. We just had one virtually, and the kids were so good. I mean, they just moved the couch to the side. They were in the kitchen on the yoga mat, but they were doing their stuff to the couch. And so it's always so wonderful that, I, that the kids always step up to what their challenge is. And that's what we do. That's, it's our job as our gymnastics coaches is to challenge them and to make them do the best that they can. And what's also joyful is the kids always step up. I mean, we just came back uh, two weeks ago or so from the national championships and 
you know, Zaquay Carter, who's been with us for a while, really talented kid, but he almost didn't go to nationals. And I was like, oh, please, Zaquay, you got to come. And then he went to nationals, which was the second time on a plane, and he won the whole thing. So it's wow. like, it, it's from one day, not even going to national champions till three days later being the national champion is a big deal. Yeah, it's a huge, it's a huge big deal. So what was it like for you during COVID-19? Obviously, all of us were behind closed doors. What was it like for you as an organization? Very tough, of course. Um, I will say this much is that, you know, but everybody had a tough time. I give it to my staff, uh, especially my head coaches, Alexis Fabu and Dennis. And then we had a lot of help from the team and our assistant coaches. Um, they turned around and went online and just really did amazing work, both with our team. It was really important. We have, you know, three competitive teams. And I wanted to make sure those kids were able to keep their skills because we didn't have access to our spot. We were out of our gym for like a year. And so what we did is, thank goodness, we have partners at different places, gymnastic centers around the city. We just carpooled or took a subway or went to Central Park and we were able to keep doing gymnastics. And, um, and so my staff was really good, both doing it virtually online. We did some really good gymnastics there. And then um, just being dedicated to the kids. And so it was a big lesson for us, but I think we came through stronger. I mean, obviously we came through. We got through a whole year and then had a national champion at the end from our competitive team and all of our kids that joined us online from not just New York, actually. Uh, they were able to join us from wherever. We're able to stay fit. And help. Yeah. Uh, you touched on something earlier I want to go back to for a second. When you talked about basically the sport of gymnastics, introducing young people to gymnastics, and you said it, you know, kind of moving along, you said, you know, gymnastics is not cheap, and it's not. But for the average viewer, they may not know exactly what that means. So share with us a little bit about what it means to say gymnastics isn't cheap. Well, gymnastics isn't cheap mainly because some basic things. You have to do it in a facility that's usually very expensive. I am no high ceilings, a lot of space, 15,000 square feet. The gymnastics equipment is expensive. You know, one of the balance beams costs about $5,000. The trampoline is $20,000. You know, the, the equipment is expensive. And then you have to have professional trained coaches to teach gymnastics from a safety standpoint. You can't have like a parent volunteer, you know, take some kids to the park. You have to have somebody right. who's done gymnastics for like five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 years. And then as a coach to teach it. So all of those are the expenses. And then, you know, it's basically, it, it's, it's something you have to invest in. And this is what I tell people and what I tell our sponsors and I tell parents, you know, this kind of focus is kind of like music, gymnastics is an individual sport right and so we take time you know you can't have like a lot of kids do it our ratio is like one to seven at most one to ten to focus on the kids so they learn in a progressive way all of that adds to the expense and then when you start traveling that's a whole nother thing right and and so it's important to that we know that though the investment is worth it the the, the type of focus that gymnasts have you will see it. that's why everybody loves some gymnastics during olympics because what those kids do, what they do out there is super amazing and that kind of focus i think when you watch a simone biles i mean for me as a gymnast i just look at her eyes and i said she's just like so relaxed and so zen and then she runs and she does something that nobody else in the world can do totally impressive so what we, right. what we do in gymnastics is we give these kids the opportunity to be their best, right? To learn how to work hard, that you have to do it, repeat it over and over again, because it's not just doing it, it's got to look good, you got to point your toes, you got to stretch your legs, it's like so complicated, but we want them to understand the process of being good, and it mm -hmm. takes work, and you need to appreciate it, and at the end, it'll serve you well. Yeah, I think about golf and I think about Tiger Woods I think about how many people actually became impacted by seeing a Tiger Woods now all of a sudden everybody wants to golf yours truly included and we're out there and we're hacking but we're doing it we've decided to take on the sport right when you look at golf um, when you look at gymnastics you look at a Simone Biles you look at a Dominic Dawes and you see somebody who's reflective of you and when you see somebody that's reflective of you it gives you a hope and an inspiration 
What do, do you find that to be the case now that we see a Simone Biles doing what she's doing? There are more and more people who have, uh, you know, this interest in, gymna uh, in gymnastics from communities of color. Definitely. It's having a role model is key. Having seen someone do it, I mean, it's a lot. I mean, I love gymnastics, but I didn't have any black role models when I did it. I, they were Russian and they were this and that, but I loved it. But I would have to say, you have to realize, so Gabby Douglas won the gold medal in 2012. She had the most impact on our program program because we were already underway. We were doing gymnastics and, you know, we we're doing our thing. Gabby Douglas won. We had a waiting list of like 150 people. <laughs> just like that yeah yeah so that kind of impact and then people have to realize gabby douglas won in 2012 it's almost 10 years that the best gymnast in the world since 2012 has been a black woman just be clear so every year like she won in 2012 and simone biles has won since 2013 until now every world championship and every meet she's been in so i think the longevity of seeing someone at the top says, like you said, it, it gives you inspiration that you can also achieve as well, if you can put in the work. Yeah, yeah. So now the summer's upon us. Talk to us about what's going on uh, in the organization. Well, we're very excited. Uh, we're back in our gym. And so we have team training for our competitive kids in the morning. And then we have a mini camp uh, for two hours every day for beginner campers. And it's really so much fun. It's actually quite good because these kids are now taking two hours of gymnastics a day, five days a week. And so everybody's getting better. And we're very excited to be back at the um, Harlem Armory, the Harlem Children's Zone. Um, and so we're, you know, it's just lovely to be able to be see people right we, we're still mm -hmm. wearing our mask because we're working with young kids but that doesn't really matter that doesn't affect their gymnastics we're still able to do that and so we do a little partners we send our coaches out to uh do a little bit of gymnastics on site but we're not full out yet but that's okay we're back in the gym we're teaching gymnastics the kids are getting better so we're very happy yeah. And what's it like for the kids? I mean, obviously, to have the opportunity to be out, to be doing it and no longer in this virtual environment. I'm sure you're having to contain a lot of excitement. <laughs> it is, but we're in gymnastics. So thankfully, we got two trampolines and a couple <laughs> other things so kids can bounce around as much as they like to. That's, that's the benefit. Yeah, yeah. And so as we go forward now, obviously, uh, if there's a parent out there that's watching or maybe a young person that's out there, what do they do? What do they, how do they get connected? You know, the best thing is to um, follow us on social media. That's where we put all of our information, Instagram, uh, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, we're all over there. And then, but I think the easiest thing is to go on our website. That's where we put our sign up for gymnastics or to call our office. We will get back to you. But we're all over there. And so when you want to find something out where, you know, follow us on YouTube. We, we also put out a lot of content, our coaches. So we have a lot of exercises that the kids can do, even if they're not with us right now. And so just reach out to us and we will keep informed on what we're doing moving forward. Yeah. Exciting, exciting times for you. What has been the most challenging over the last few months? Hmm, the most challenging. That's a good question. You know, I think it was hard for everybody. Everybody was kind of zoomed out, right? Mm -hmm. um, you just want to think it was hard to keep everybody's attention. But I will say that, um, you know, we're just happy to be back. It was it was just hard. I think everybody was just kind of tired of this whole pandemic. And, you know, we can't get tired because that is what it is. And we got to be careful of what's coming next. But the biggest challenge would be just fatigue, but the greatest joy has been that the staff has kept the kids happy and the kids always give us a lot of joy because, you know, doing gymnastics is fun. And when we're on that environment, it just brings us all joy. Yeah, yeah. And, and shout out to your staff. I mean, obviously, you know, being able to pivot uh, in this virtual environment is huge, but from what you tell me, uh, your staff was able to turn a corner. 
they really did. I mean, they were great because you had to support the kids, right? Even when we were on Zoom, you know, they were in school. That's one thing all day. But when they had their gymnastics teacher talk to them, even though once a week they put on their leotard or their purple shirt and they, they get this type of attention and there was movement that was directed. And then sometimes we had to talk to the kids. We're like, how are you feeling? You know, do some jokes, have a movie night. It was just connecting with them that wasn't their teachers. It wasn't their parents. It was their gymnastics teacher. And so uh, I really give it to them for taking on the responsibility of keeping our kids in the community inspired. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're about out of time. But before we go, you get the final word to uh, let people know what, they want to know what you want them to know. Well, I would like them to visit us at wendyhillier.org, send that support, uh, any donation helps because we serve all kinds of kids and small and large donations. And this investment will go a long way and also enjoy the Olympics because it's gonna be a wild ride. Yeah, it's gonna be pretty interesting, but uh, tis the season, glad to have you with us during Olympic season. Uh, and as we're preparing to see what comes of it and uh, who knows, you know, another win and maybe another 150 coming at the door. <laughs> You never know. You never know. Wendy Hilliard, thank you so much for being with us here. Thank you. Glad to be here. All righty. I want to let you know that we have come to the end of our social justice forums. We certainly appreciate our guests for coming, but we want to continue to elevate the conversation. How do we do that? That means you got to come back next week. We'll continue to talk about this and a whole lot more. There's a lot of inequity out there. There's a lot of great people doing some great work. And right here on the social justice forums, we're trying to do our best to introduce you to the resources and make you aware. I'm Darren Jaime saying take care. We'll see you soon on the social justice forums.